Good morning and happy Sunday. Welcome to our November 17th, 2019 service from La Jolla Presbyterian Church. Today, Rev. Dr. Paul Cunningham is preaching. Paul's sermon is titled, Wrapping It All Up. It's the 10th and final week of the fall sermon series titled, Stranger in a Strange Land, Finding Hope in 1 Peter. Today we're looking at 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. We'll spend some time talking about the devil and Peter's closing charge to the church living far from home. If you would like to connect with our church, you can find our website at ljpress.org. We hope to see lives transformed by our relationship with Jesus, and we strive to be a place where you experience and are able to express that transforming love of Christ. And now here's Paul with Wrapping It All Up. Well, good morning, and uh, it's great to be here and to be worshiping our God who gives us hope and the God who gives us life. Uh, a couple things to just kind of catch you up to speed on. One, uh, many of you are aware that in the month of November, we have a special matching gift going towards solar. We have uh, got all of the panels up now, and we uh, are in the process of hooking everything up to the city. And so um, we have received a $50,000 uh, matching gift, and we are well on our way to making that. But if you have been thinking to yourself that, hey, I should be giving this solar project. I think we should all go green. This will be great for the church and great for ministry and mission. Uh, the month of November would be a great time to do that. As I have been sharing, um, our hope is that we can actually pay most of this off, if not all of this off, uh, by the end of the year and start recouping some of those costs. We anticipate uh, saving at least $40,000 a year in utility bills um, by going green. So um, anyway, we just want to continue to put that out there. We've got about, what day is today? The 18th. Um, 12 more days to go, so I uh, would love to have your support in that endeavor. Uh, this morning, we are wrapping up uh, what has been a 10-week sermon series on Peter's first letter to the churches that were scattered uh, throughout what today we would think of as modern-day Turkey. And next Sunday, we're going to look at Colossians 2 as we kind of move into Thanksgiving. And then during the season of Advent, the theme is going to be around the idea of making room. Um, to think through how God has made room for us, but how also the implications of that is, are that we are to make room for others and to make room for God as well. And so we're going to be talking around uh, that theme of making room. As we move into January, we're going to be taking a look at where we find Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, sometimes it's called typology. Sometimes we see these angels of the Lord. Uh, but the Old Testament is really helping to foreshadow us and prepare us for the arrival of Christ, which, of course, happens uh, during Lent and the season of Easter. So that's kind of for those of you who like to kind of plan ahead or at least know that your pastor is somewhat planning ahead. Um, there you go. That's where we're going to be. So uh, if you were here last week, you know that we took a look at this concept of suffering and not so much a theology of suffering, but hopefully more a theology for the sufferer of how do we process that and what does it mean uh, to walk into the darkness knowing that at the end of that we will meet Christ. Uh, this morning, if you've taken a look at the text, there's all sorts of themes going on. There's a the theme of pride. There's a the theme of humility. There's a the theme of casting our anxieties on God. There's the theme of doxology, as Peter kind of, kind of wraps up his letter. And then, of course, there's the devil. And, you know, every Sunday morning, it's kind of like, what, what, sort, you know, what sort of leading illustration do you have on a Sunday morning to make sure I don't want to lose the crowd within the first three minutes, right? So, so I, I do spend some time uh, most Sundays trying or preparing for Sundays of coming up with, you know, how do you kind of engage people and make people think as we're kind of moving in uh, to our text? And so I was like, well, what's the opening? I was like, oh, we should talk about the devil. That'll be a great way to kind of get everybody wide awake. My Pentecostal friends are finally like, Thank God, Paul, about time you're going to talk about the devil. You lifelong Presbyterians are like, oh, Lord, have mercy. Um, we're reformed. We like things decently and in order. And, and, and I think one of the struggles we have with, and we're going to get to our text, I promise, in, in a few minutes. But just bear with me for a few minutes. One of the problems we have when we talk about the issue of the devil or of Satan is, is we really... We, we don't, some of us don't know what to do with that. We either go in one or two different directions. We either see the devil in everything or we see, we just think the devil's not, you know, it's just, it just doesn't exist. So I was laughing. I don't know if this, this probably doesn't happen to you, but this is what happens in my house that makes me realize the reality of the devil. 
why are you all laughing? Like, you don't even know what I'm going to say yet. Here's what happens. If our smoke detectors are going to have their batteries fail. Now, you have to understand, before I even get started in this story, the thing that freaks our dogs out the most is that beep, beep, but it's way higher pitch, right? And it, it's like they sense it before it even happens. And so this is why I'm convinced the devil is real. Because if our smoke detector batteries are going to fail, it is going to happen on a Sunday morning between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. That is the only time they ever fail. Now, for most of you, it's like, who cares? Big deal. Saturday night, Sunday morning, whatever. For me, it's awful, right? So guess what happened this morning when I'm preaching on the devil? Literally, you can ask my wife, this is absolutely true. At 1234, one of our dogs started to bark. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And all of a sudden I heard it. Boop. The devil is real. Don't mess with me, Satan, on a Sunday morning, right? And, and we, we, you know, and it's like we don't want to see Satan in everything, but I swear every time our smoke alarm batteries go, fail, it is on a Sunday morning between 12 and 2 a.m. You can ask my wife about that. She will totally agree with that. So there's this struggle then, though, of, of kind of all the ways in which we have perceived of the devil or what the media has perceived or what... Uh, television, film, whatever you want to call it, or what we read about in the scriptures, of how do we deal with the issue of the devil? And, you know, literally, if you look at that word devil, it means to, to divide. Like, what is the devil? He is about dividing. He's about creating chasm. The word Satan uh, that we read in the New Testament and, and also in the Old uh, has to do with the idea of being the adversary, and, and oftentimes in our lives, we, we like to think of that which is supernatural. We love the supernatural that's good. Like we love that, that, the, you know, the, that, that, that God has these supernatural forces that, that, that look out for us, these angels and, and all of this. We, we love that idea, but we don't like the supernatural that's bad. And we kind of want to just either ignore it or not deal with it. C.S. Lewis his book, The Screw Tape Letters, we've used this before. Um, I, I think he has profound wisdom when he speaks about the devil or devils in this case. He says, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, the devils, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. What Lewis is driving at is we don't do a very good job of finding a middle ground when it comes to talking about the adversary, when it comes to talking about the devil. We either see the devil in everything, like in smoke detectors with bad batteries that go off at 1230 in the morning, or we simply say, oh, we're just really not into that. We're not really sure that that's real. And Lewis says, and this is from Screwtape Letters, if you've read Screwtape Letters, he says, both of those we have to be wary of. Now, this is a quote from Lewis that I I came across this one this week. um, And and this is a little more scary for someone like me based on my age and stage. And here's what Lewis says. This is another quote from Screwtape. He says, the long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather for the devil. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> In not so many great ways. But I mean, you think, just leave that, I mean, just look at that quote. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle aged prosperity, whether good or middle aged adversity, not so good, are excellent campaigning weather for the devil. Because everything kind of changes as we move into middle age. The kids move out. Perhaps we've been very active in church and alive and everything else. And the kids kind of all start going to college. And we kind of start losing our way. And things are really good. And so we don't think we need to be around. Or things are really bad. We don't want to be around. And Lewis says, be very wary. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. This is actually what I wanted to start with. But we'll back up to it because it's a great understanding and a reminder of how the apostle Paul says that the devil lurks around. And he says, uh, and no wonder for Satan himself 
masquerades. Oops. This is the very first slide. This is my bad because I completely skipped it. Let's see if we've got that. No, okay. Take my word for it. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. No wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. That's what Paul says. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Do you know what Satan is about? He mas- Peter says he's a roaring lion. We're going to read that in just a second. Jesus says Satan exists. And Paul says Satan masquerades as an angel of light. This is why we have to be careful, folks. Because it's not always the roaring lion. Paul says Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So we feeling good now? God, I have everybody's attention in terms of, aren't you glad you showed up on this Sunday morning? But we're not left alone in all of this. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. You all know this, may know this verse well. It talks about the armor of God. But the Apostle Paul continues to lean into this idea that the devil is real. For our struggle, this is verse 12, Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against these principalities, these rulers. Therefore, Paul says, and this is the answer, and I'm not going to read all the armor of God. You can read all this for yourself. Paul says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. So Paul says, look, this spiritual stuff that goes on is real. We need to recognize that. We need to adhere to it. We need to be reminded of it. We don't just kind of blow it off. and Say as though this supernatural power of evil is not real. Because Paul says it's real. But he says God has also given us a defense against it. And some of you have experienced this. If you've done camping ministry, like my wife and I did for a number of years, you know all the reality of what spiritual warfare is all about. I will never forget, and this is now, this is now no longer a little fun story about fire det- or smoke detectors going off. This was years ago. I mean, this was 30 plus years ago. I still remember as though it was yesterday. We had had a campfire, a high school camp. It was a commitment night, Wednesday night. Speaker had done an amazing job. Lots of kids had decided to make decisions for Jesus. And at our camp, after they were done making decisions for Jesus, we'd send them off uh, with, their, with their cabin, and they would pray. And um, then our staff would go, and we would have our debrief staff meeting. And so we had a campfire in one area, and then we had our, the house or the, the room where we gathered to kind of debrief how the things had gone. And um, the evening had been amazing. And I realized when I got down to where our meeting was is that I had forgotten something up at the campfire. And so I left the room and began walking maybe the four or 500 yards, whatever it was, uh, to get to the campfire. And I literally tell you that when I walked out of that room and I started walking towards the campfire, the presence of evil was so real that literally the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And I knew, I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, Satan is so angry. I don't know who was there. I don't know what happened that night. I have no idea how to explain why that was. But I felt evil like I have never felt it. And I was like, I'm on holy ground. This is church camp. Devil, get the heck out of here, right? You have no place here. And I share that with you not to kind of wig you out or to get all my Pentecostal friends super happy that I believe in spiritual warfare and and all that sort of stuff. I do. I mean, I really do. Um, But I share that with you saying, I think we have to be ready and we have to be wary. Peter, in the text we're going to read in just a minute, I promise we're getting there, says, be sober-minded and alert. Watch out for this angel, that watch out for this devil who masquerades as an angel of light. Be very wary. Because it's not always as a roaring lion that Satan's going to appear. But it's often just in enough way to distract us and take our eye off the ball. Peter says, be alert and sober minded. Now, what's interesting is that word, be alert. 
or the words was the word that Jesus spoke to Peter, James, and John when they were in the garden of Gethsemane. You remember this? Peter's like, you know, Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to die. Peter's like, no, you're not going to die. Jesus is like, I'm going to die, and you're going to deny me. Peter is like, Lord, I'll never deny you. And P- Jesus is like, yeah, you are going to do that, and it's going to be bad and everything else, and we know how that story goes. But when they go out to the garden of Gethsemane, do you remember what Jesus says to them? Watch and pray. And do you remember what they do? Right? I mean, just instant asleep. A couple more times, Jesus comes back. All I want you to do is watch and pray. And they get lulled into sleep. And they're not alert. And so what I want to do, I mean, and and for those of you who are already uncomfortable, be at peace because we're just about done with this part of the sermon. But I do this in the sense of saying, we've got to be aware. Our battle is not against, as the Apostle Paul says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. There is stuff going on out there that we are unaware of. And for us to be alert and to keep our eyes open to what it is that might be happening around us. And to cry out to God in the midst of that. When I felt that evil, I began to cry out to God like nothing else. Because I knew that Satan had no place at that camp. That he did not belong. And so like C.S. Lewis says, in your own life, we need to figure out where that balance lies. Okay, so I have your everyone's attention now. Right? Okay, good. We're already a third of the way through the sermon. So that's the good. And I haven't even got to our text yet this morning. But I, I really, you know, we, we don't talk about the devil a lot. And I just think that, you know, when Scripture offers that opportunity, um, I think we need to do that. I think you all need to know what I think about it as well. Um, because I do, I mean, it, it is real. The presence of evil, the supernatural power of the devil, of Satan, it's reality. And we have to be aware of it. Okay. So we're at First Peter chapter 5, uh, the very last chapter, verses 6 through 11. We're covering all but the last uh, three verses or three verses of First Peter chapter 5. So if you'd pray with me, that'd be great. And then we're going to move into this text. Oh God, um, to speak of spiritual warfare and to speak of the devil and the presence and reality of Satan um, is something that we need to be about. Jesus made it very clear uh, that there was a devil. Paul believed that. Peter believed that. And Lord, for us, we need to see and believe that as well. Um, So, Lord, help us to wrestle through what that looks like in our own lives. But, Lord, as we look at this text uh, this morning in particular, help us to think about these other issues that are also raised by Peter as he wraps up this lesson. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Peter writes, it's now after we've gotten through the issue of, of suffering, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, I, I want to ask, how do we have that up there? Okay, let's, um, okay, so can we look at the first verse? I want to just mention this one. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And then there really shouldn't be a period there. Okay, it's really more of a comma. And then we'll keep reading. And it's basically saying, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So it's kind of one sentence as you, as you see that. It's this idea that we're to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand so that God can lift us up as we cast our anxiety on him. So those things are connected. That's the one thing I want to make sure because we're going to be spending some time on that this morning. Um, because that issue of humility and anxiety and casting our anxiety on God, they're all connected. All right, verse 8, this is what we've been talking about. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Remember, the goal of the devil is to divide. Divide families, divide friends, divide relationships, divide churches. That has always been what the devil is about. The more successful he is about creating chasms and bringing division, the happier he feels. Uh, The devil feels happiness. I don't know if the devil feels happiness. I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, I'm just saying that he's about division. It's never about addition. It's always about subtraction and division. And the God of all grace 
Now Peter ends with doxology. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So we have this problem of humility and anxiety and this idea of that if we're to live with humility, we must learn to cast our anxieties on, upon God. But the bigger dilemma is this. The bigger dilemma is our pride. Pride is in direct contrast to humility. My pride, my building of myself up, my building of my kingdom, my building of my walls, my, my, my creating the story and then framing all of it around my story, my desire and my need to always be right. My pride keeps me from being humble. Pride is always competitive. It always seeks power. It always wants to be in the driver's seat. And so before we can even talk about humility, we have to talk about pride. Because I am convinced that, that we can only receive, that, that, that the, the amount of grace that we can receive is really based on the amount of pride that we have. If I am a highly prideful person, if I'm not walking with humility, it's very difficult for me to receive the grace of God. I read this great quote. Um, I don't know who said this quote, but they said, pride is like bad breath. Everybody knows you have it except for you. I was like, well, that's kind of, kind of gross, but, um, but kind of true. I mean, this is the problem of pride. Like sometimes we need to do a pride check with our loved one or our friends of like, man, am I, am I living, you know, am I, am I walking in humility or am I so filled with pride? And so the struggle for us with pride is, is it builds up these walls that, that, or, or it frames a narrative that we want to create so that the outside world thinks that everything is all right. And they don't see what's happening on the inside. They don't see the fear. They don't see the anxiety. They don't know the devastation that we're walking on, be, walking through because we're constantly trying to frame this narrative and frame this story that everything's okay, that I've got this, that I'm faster, I'm smarter, I'm brighter, I'm however it is that you want to describe this. And this is an extreme hindrance to humility. But here's the interesting thing. It's not a hindrance to God. And it's certainly not a hindrance to Jesus Christ. So I think about this story and I think about, okay, we frame our lives and we build our lives and we put up these walls and we put up these doors and we protect ourselves. We look great on the outside and everything else seems to be going fine. And then guess what happens? We have a Lord who can do what? Walk through walls. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, seriously? Remember that story, right? Thomas is like, and I don't believe this stuff. And unless if I see Jesus and I, and I can touch him and see that he has been raised from the dead, I am not going to believe any of that stuff. And so you remember what happens in John chapter 20, right? The apostles go to this, this room and they're scared because they lock the doors. They've built this story, but now they're filled with fear and they're filled with anxiety. And they're like, there's all this stuff that we did. Is this whole thing that we have built, has it all collapsed because Jesus has not been raised from the dead? And then John chapter 20, verse 26 well, here comes Jesus, and this time he's not walking on water, right? He's walking through walls, which is incredible. A week later, the disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. In the midst of your fear, in the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of you locking all the doors so that no one can get in, 
I'm coming in. Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me and you have believed, you, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. How many of us in our own lives have been building up these walls? How many of us in our own lives have been living these prideful lives that construct these stories that are always pointing to us? That are always trying to let others know how great we are? And what that can do to us and what it does to people is it can fill us with fear. It can fill us with anxiety. What if we're found out? I mean, how many of us live like that? What if the world really knew? What if my friends really knew? And the beautiful thing about our faith is we have a Savior who says, I'll just walk right through that. Whatever it is that you have built, I can come right into it. It doesn't matter. And Jesus says, my peace I give you. He humbles himself. I mean, when we want to think about what humility is all about, we look to Christ who counted equality with God, nothing to be grasped as Paul describes it in Philippians 2. But he made himself a servant. And during Lent next year, during the season of Lent next spring, we're going to talk about Jesus washing the feet of the apostles and what that means and what that symbolizes for us. But in my mind, what it does for us is begins to point to the path of humility. And as what Peter is describing is saying, as we humble ourselves, we then cast all of those anxieties onto God. Because God's big enough for them. Humility, um, this is often attributed to C.S. Lewis. It's not, I don't know, C.S. Lewis didn't write it. That much I do know. I don't know who wrote it. Um, but it's a great line and we've used it before. I've probably said before that C.S. Lewis wrote it because that's what I grew up understanding. Anyway, uh, the quote is this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less often. Right? It's not like, whoa, whoa, whoa is me and all this sort of stuff and boom, 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 you know, flailing and flagellating and all that sort of stuff. It's not that. It's not thinking less of ourselves. It's thinking of ourselves less often. It's about the path of service. It's the path of not always having to get the credit. Not always having to be the voice up front speaking. Learning to serve and learning to walk in humility. But as we do that, there's this wonderful thing that happens. What Peter is describing here, and and this is really, I mean, this is a, this text is all over the place. And so I I admit it was, it was kind of hard to pull a whole sermon together here talking about the devil and humility and pride. And we're going to get to doxology in just a minute. But, but there is this sense of saying what we are to do with our lives is, is, is God, we're told to cast our anxiety. That means to throw, that means once and for all, that means to keep, you know, and and it's hard with anxiety and it's hard with worry to keep doing that. But the the understanding of it is, is if you do it once and for all, God takes it. Now our problem is we keep getting distracted by our anxieties and by our worries. But Matthew chapter six, verse 25 through 34, you all know this story. It's a great reminder for us, a word I need to hear on a fairly regular basis. Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, therefore I tell you, this is 25, verse 25, Matthew 6. 
Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? How many of you believe that? Right? If I just keep worrying about it, man, I'm going to live longer and be more blessed by Jesus. I don't think that's what he's saying here, actually. But we do this and we believe this and the world forces us into this and our mindsets force us to this. And Jesus says, and why do you worry about clothes? Look at the flowers, of the, see how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spend. Yet I tell you that even Sol- not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry. Okay, I'm saying this, right? This is, I'm not saying this. This is Jesus saying this. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first. This is where this all leads. Seek first God's kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus, in this, you know, if you look at Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, it's really kind of a short course on, on the Christian life. And in the midst of that, he says, here's what you do with anxiety. Let God handle that. You're not going to add any more hours to your life by worrying. And I know it's easy to say it. It's harder to do it. But we have to keep reminding ourselves of that promise. Because the promise is that God is with us. Um, you know, we don't just cast it aside. I want to be very clear on that, that when Peter is saying, cast your burdens onto God, he's not saying throw them to the wayside. He's saying, put them on God, right? You all with me on that? Because that's a huge difference. Because sometimes we just kind of blow stuff off and push it off the side and say, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. No, you give it to God. You're like, God, I'm sick and tired of this mess, this, whatever it is that you are in the midst of. You need to take it, and I'm dumping it on you because you're big enough to handle it. My shoulders can't handle it. Yours can. So I'm giving it to you. And you can talk to God like that if you want to, okay, right? Y'all don't think so? You can. God's big enough. Trust me. He knows, okay? Just, just let him, you know, say it. And, and, and there's a great promise. And I saw this. I, I, had, not, I had not seen this before. But I love this verse because it's saying that God recognizes, I mean, this, this idea of anxiety and worry, it's going to be with us all of our lives. Like, we all recognize that. But I love Isaiah, verse, chapter 40, Isaiah 46, verse 4. And I love what God says here. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Even when you're old and gray, God says, do you know what? Do you know what? I will sustain you. I have made you. I will carry you and I will rescue you. What an incredible gift. That's why we can go to God with confidence. That's why Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Do you see these themes? They are throughout Scripture. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Because God says, I'm with you till the end. Even with gray hairs and old age, I will sustain you. And so Peter starts thinking about this and thinking about the reality of what this means and thinking about the reality of the devil that we talked about earlier and thinking about the reality of what it is to live with humility and to cast our anxieties onto God and to give those over to God. And then he ends with doxology because he's like, this God, this is the God who is with us. This is the God who has saved us in Jesus Christ. And you can see Peter just imagining his life story with, with Jesus and all the hanging out they had done as he starts to crescendo up and says, this is the God who promises. It is very similar to what Isaiah 46 says, the God who will st- sustain you, the God who will restore you, the God who will ground you in a firm foundation. And he says, to God be the glory. Amen. It's his doxology of saying, this is it. Like as he wraps everything up and he says, look, the devil is real and suffering is real and hard times are going to come, but God's got you. And do not ever forget that. He ends with high praise. 
as he reminds us that God is with us forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to wrap up. We've hit a lot of scriptures today. Wrap up with the blessing that uh, we're familiar with from the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. But I love the last verse, which is verse 27. But just hear the words of the blessing. This is the words that God gives to Moses, to give to Aaron, to give to the priests, to bless the nation of Israel. Y'all know these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his, uh, turn his face. Every, there's all these new translations. I never get it right. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And then, this is why I love verse 27. So these priests will put my name on them, on the Israelites, and I will bless them. You see, the blessing isn't just about the words that go over you. The blessing God is saying, do you know what happens when I bless my people? I put my name on them. I don't only put my hand over them. I place my name on them. So as you go out of here, when I give that benediction in just a couple of minutes, you go out as one who has been blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ, but you also go out as one who has been named, who has been called by name. And God says, I'm putting my name on you. This is what Peter is recalling as he thinks about to God be the glory. Amen and amen. This idea that God not only loves us and God has endured for us and God has blessed us, but God says, I'm placing my name on you. You bear my grace. You bear my goodness. You bear my holiness into the world and nothing can keep that from happening. Pray with me, please. Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for difficult texts that, um, Lord, don't always seem to connect, but have really good reminders in them. Lord, make us wary of the spiritual things that go on around us. Make us wary of the the devil who masquerades as an angel of light. Lord, make us wary of our own pride, the building up of our walls, the building up of our lives that does not give you glory, but only is for us. Lord, remind us that Jesus walks into our lives and wants to give us his peace. Lord, whatever it is that we have tried to do or create around us, he just steps in and says, let me bless you. And Lord, may we receive that blessing and know that as a result of that blessing, we get to live a life that is marked by doxology, that we get to praise the living God who has restored us, who has restored us, redeemed us, and grounded us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
So when you walk out in the courtyard this morning, do not be overwhelmed. There's a lot of stuff happening on our courtyard. There is the Mission Gift Market if you want to figure out a way to sponsor and help out. Um, give someone a great Christmas gift. We have that going. Ginger Christensen is selling scarves, uh, raising funds for some of the scholarships that we offer to kids in our mission partner areas. Uh, Frank Gordon is out there with the facilities team talking about going green. If you have questions about solar, I believe that Good Company is also out there. Did I forget anything else that's going on out there? Uh, there's a lot of stuff. If you're interested in having a tour of our stained glass windows, every third Sunday of the month, Ron Bowles, our director of worship and arts, leads that. He'll be over here at 1015 this morning, um, right over this, by this window to my right. If you would like to uh, just hear this incredible story of what's behind these windows and the story behind those windows. Um, if you need prayer this morning or know of others who need prayer, we'll have members of our prayer ministry team and our deacons available in the back, who I know would love to pray with or for you. Now, as you go from this place, receive our Lord's blessing as you go. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God the Father, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for listening. The holidays can be a difficult time for those who have suffered the loss of a loved one. If you've experienced the loss this year and the holidays are looking different, we invite you to our Blue Christmas Service of Remembrance, Friday, December 6th at 3 p.m. in room LC1 and the chapel. Family members and friends are welcome. Please RSVP to Laura Mitchell. Laura's email address is M-I-T-C-H-L-S and the number 4 at gmail.com. Women of all ages are invited to the Women's Christmas Tea on Saturday, December 7th from 10 to 11.30 a.m. in Fellowship Hall. Join us for a Christmas tea with caroling, cookies, decorating, and a Christmas story. Daughters and granddaughters are welcome. Tea and coffee and light brunch is included. For more information, contact Lindsay Ocello. Lindsay's email is L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-O-C-H-E-L-L-O. Lindsay Ocello at gmail.com. The best catalog of the season, the Mission Partner Catalog, is now available. It has gifts for everyone on your shopping list. Explore the catalog through the end of the year and see all the opportunities for the creative gift giving and ways to bless 30 mission partners. Plus, there are child sponsoring opportunities in Belize, Mexico, and Malawi. Finally, LJPC has recently made a decision to go green with solar panels. Donations have exceeded $250,000, and we're hoping to pay off the debt by 2020. Generous donors have offered a $50,000 matching gift for all new gifts received before the end of November. Please consider making a one-time donation beyond your normal giving to help us meet this goal. What a wonderful blessing this is. There are pledge cards in the pews and the church office, and it's safe and easy to give online. You can look for the blue donate button toward the bottom of any page on the website. Click on that, log in, and you'll see a spot there for Solar Campaign. You can find a complete listing of what's going on around the Hoya Press on our website at ljpress.org. That's l-j-p-r-e-s dot o-r-g. Or call the church office at 858-454-0713. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings. And we hope to see you soon.